Hello and welcome to today's lesson looking at gravitational potential which forms part of the gravitational fields topic in the AQA A-level physics specification. So in today's lesson we're going to look in a gravitational potential and try and understand gravitational potential and how work can be done on massive objects. So we're going to define what, a, what gravitational potential is and why zero at infinity calculate the gravitational potential and gravitational potential difference for all objects and understand what equipotential surfaces are and their importance in fields, which falls into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification. So a field, as I said before, is a very important concept to define in the universe. Now a field is a region in the universe where an object placed inside of it can experience a non-contact force due to its position in the field. Now there are a couple of properties which we can use to describe the field. Now one of these is the potential, which details the energy stored in one object per unit property of the field due to the object being in the field, which is, tends to be due to the field produced in the universe. So for example, the gravitational potential is the energy per unit mass experienced by an object inside a gravitational field. Now, if we consider a gravitational field produced by a mass, now, any other massive object placed in the gravitational field will become a store of gravitational potential energy. Now, the gravitational potential energy store is produced as a result of the resultant gravitational force acting on the object due to it being in the gravitational field. Now, this energy so is due to the attraction between the masses. Now, this gives us the concept of something called absolute gravitational potential. That's the gravitational potential energy stored per unit mass due to an object being placed at a point in the gravitational field. Now, we give this quantity the symbol V. Now, it's important to note that we can set the absolute potential to be zero at any location in the universe, but as convention sake, we choose to set this at infinity. So at infinity, the absolute potential of an object is always zero. Now we define infinity in this context as any region outside of the gravitational field, or when the r, the radius, the, diff, the distance between the massive object and the gravitational potential energy store is very, 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 very large. Now we set infinity to have zero zero absolute potential as the object, the particle, is outside of the field, so no longer feels some force from the field, so therefore can no longer be a gravitational potential energy store due to that massive object. Now the absolute gravitational potential is the energy stored per unit mass in an object due to have been in the gravitational field. Now we can work it out with the following equation. V equals minus G m over R, where G is the universal gravitational constant, m is the mass of the object producing the gravitational field, not the mass of the object in the gravitational field. And R is the separation between the object in the field and the object making the field. Now, this is not the inverse square law. It's not R squared. It's just R. So when the distance between the two objects doubles, the potential halves. When the distance trebles, the potential decreases by a third. So the potential and separation are inversely proportional. Now, gravitational potential is always considered a negative on the surface of a mass and increases with distance from the mass. This is very important and you've got to be aware why this is and it's a very common examination question. It's because energy needs to be placed into an object to escape a gravitational field because gravity is always attractive. So if you are in a gravitational field and you need to get out of the gravitational field, energy always needs to be supplied to that particular field. Now, this means that to reach infinity, which we've said we've defined to be zero, we place, we've place we got to place a positive value of energy in, so that value of potential must originally be negative. So this is very important because gravitational potential is a scalar because both energy and mass okay, are scalars, and this makes it one of the only scalars in the entire convention of physics to be given a negative term. But please note it doesn't have a direction. Now let's look at an example question regarding gravitational potential. So a question might ask you, find the gravitational potential V at the surface of the Earth. The Earth's mass is 5.98 times 10 to 24 kilograms and its radius is 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. So step one, you write out the equation. Step two, you'll place the values into the equation. So we've got 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 for big G, 
5.98 times 10 to the 24 for the mass of the Earth, and 6.37 times 10 to the 6 for the radius between the centre of the field, which is the core of the Earth, and the surface, which is where the question is being asked from. We then calculate the values, and you get an answer of 6.2616 times 10 to the 7. However, what we've got to do is we've got to give our value to the correct number of significant figures. Now, you'll notice in the question... 5.98, 6.37, they're both three, three significant figures, so give our answer to three significant figures, and we've also got to give our units, joules per kilogram. So, the absolute gravitational potential, like we said before, is the energy stored per unit mass in an object due to it being in the gravitational field. And we can actually show this relationship of V against R in the following graph. Now you'll notice a few things. By using tangents, because it's a curve, it's not a straight line, we can find the gradient at any point of the graph. So the gradient is going to be the change in y over the change in x, which is delta v over delta r. Now we call this the potential gradient. How, how quickly, how steeply the potential changes in a field. Now from the potential, the potential gradient is actually the gravitational field strength. Because if we say gradient is delta V over R, and we said before that V equals or minus GM over R, then we divide that by R, that then becomes GM over R squared, so it's actually just G. So that's a very important idea that the gradient of a VR graph is actually the gravitational field strength at a particular point for that gravitational field. Now, if we consider a gravitational field produced by a mass, like we mentioned before, any massive object in the gravitational field becomes a store of gravitational potential energy. Now, again, it's a scalar quantity because gravitational potential energy is stored in the object. It's not in a particular direction. And it's considered an absolute quantity because it's not dependent on any other factor except the gravitational field. Now, it's important to note that we can also work out something called gravitational potential, which is different to the absolute gravitational potential, because the gravitational potential is the work done per unit mass to move an object from infinity, where we've set our gravitational potential to be zero, to a point in the gravitational field. Now, as we've as said before, we've defined the gravitational potential to be zero at infinity because the object is not in the gravitational field. However, inside the gravitational field, the gravitational potential is non-zero as it's become a gravitational potential energy store due to being in the field. So let's just make sure we understand the difference between the two quantities. Absolute gravitational potential is the energy stored per unit mass due to an object being placed in the field. However, gravitational potential is the work done per unit mass in moving an object into a gravitational field from infinity. So this actually means that gravitational potential and absolute gravitational potential will always have the same magnitude because if you remember at infinity it's zero so the difference from zero is just going to be the same as the actual number of the value so going from zero to 60 is like just the same as having 60 in the field. So the two quantities will have the same magnitude but the difference is you've now got a direction involved because you know in which direction it's acting in. But this also leads to a fundamental concept in physics. Moving an object in different values of potential needs work to be carried out onto or from the object. Now, if we consider the gravitational potentials found in the Earth's field, it can look something, something like this. Now, this allows you to understand the concept of gravitational potential in terms of energy stores. Now, if you let one kilogram drop from infinity to the surface of the Earth, in this case, it'll lose 63 megajoules from its potential energy store. Ignore any dissipative forces, and the object will have that kinetic energy store okay, when it hits the surface of the planet, which shows you why we use these concepts of gravitational potential. Now, let's just make sure we're aware of this. Dashed lines in gravitational field diagrams represent the different potentials found in the gravitational field. Now, objects can move between different areas of gravitational potential, but this requires work to be done. So we say the object is 
to move due to potential difference. Now, the potential difference, or delta V, is calculated by working out the difference between the potential areas the object is moved between. So in this example, it's gone from minus 240 to minus 120, so the potential difference is minus 120 joules per kilogram. Now, just remember, the potential difference is the work done per unit mass needed to move an object. This is because the gravitational potential is the energy at each level per unit mass. So if we move from one point to another, it's the change in energy per mass or the work done per unit mass. Now, remember that the potential will always become less negative as the object moves away from the massive object producing the gravitational field. This makes sense as less work needs to be done into, into the object to overcome the gravitational attraction and leave the field to have its potential become zero. So this will work because gravity is always an attractive effect. Now this gives us our equation of delta V equals work done over M. So we're going to rearrange this for our equation to be work done is equal to mass times by change in potential. So this equation tells you that the work done needed to move an object between two points of different potential in a gravitational field. So it tells you the work done needed to move an object over a potential difference in a gravitational field. Now please note in this equation, m refers to the mass of the object moving, it's small m, not the mass of the object producing the field. Now it also tells us that the work done needed to move any object is directly proportional to the potential difference if the mass of the object remains the same throughout the move, which it tends to be in most situations. So let's have a look at an example question. A forklift truck does 2,120 joules of work to increase a pig's gravitational potential by 26.5 joules per kilogram. What's the mass of the pig? Well, step one, you write out the equation. M equals work done over change in potential. You place the values into the equation, you then calculate the values, and you put a unit, and you may just write number significant figures, so it's 80 kilograms. Now, we can represent this idea here of our gravitational potential difference with the following graph. Now, the area under the line for a G against R graph tells us the work done needed to move an object through a gravitational field. Now, because work done is a scalar, the value must always be positive. So as a result, it's always above that X axis. Now, in this diagram, the dashed lines show the planes in the field where the gravitational potential is the same. So on the top line, the potential along this line is always minus 120 joules per kilogram. The potential along the bottom line is always minus 300 joules per kilogram. Now, as the potential along the line is the same or equal, we call this a line of equipotential. Now, work is needed to be done to move an object between planes of different potential, but there's no change in potential along a line of equipotential. So if an object moves along a plane or a line of equipotential, no work is done. Now, that's very important. This means a mass can travel along a la an equipotential line without any energy being transferred. There's no change in potential, so there's no, cha there's no work being done in that particular massive object. So in radial fields, the lines of equipotential are spherical spheres. Now note, lines of equipotential are always represented by dashed lines. Remember, no work is done when you travel along an equipotential line. A mass can travel along an equipotential line without any work being done. Now lines of equipotential are found at 90 degrees to the field lines of the gravitational field. Now, you'll be expected to deduce lines of equipotential from gravitational field line diagrams. Now, this is a diagram which shows the lines of equipotential in the Earth's gravitational field. Now, equipotential surfaces around a spherical mass are also spherical. Now, this has big implications for any orbiting body in a gravitational field, because the potential energy store of a satellite in a circular orbit around the Earth, in this case, or any orbiting body, remains constant provided that its distance from the centre of the Earth does not change as the on a plane of equipotential. So for a satellite in an elliptical object, uh, an orbit, sorry, where there's not the same um, 
radius, its change in position, there's an interchange between the kinetic energy store and the potential energy store as it's not on a plane of epic potential. Now, moving, and moving to a higher orbit increases its gravitational potential energy store because work is being done away from the Earth. This comes from the kinetic energy store of the, of the satellite to the satellite orbit slower. But moving to a lower orbit decreases its gravitational potential energy store as it's now closer to the center of the field. This will increase its kinetic energy store and it makes the satellite orbit faster. So what have we learned in today's lesson? We should hopefully understand the definition of gravitational potential and understand why it's a zero value at infinity. We should understand what gravitational potential difference is and know the equation work done in moving mass m is given by work done is equal to mass times by change in potential. We understand about equipotential surfaces and the idea that no work is done when moving along equipotential surfaces. We know that V in a radial field is given by the equation V equals minus GM over R. We understand the importance of that negative sign and the graphical representation of G and V with R. And we know that, we know that the gravitational field strength G is equal to that gradient of that graph. And the delta V is from the area of the graph of G against R. So in this lesson, if we're being successful and we've learned, we can define what gravitational potential is and why it's zero at infinity. We can calculate the gravitational potential and the gravitational potential difference for all objects. And we understand what equipotential surfaces are and their importance in fields. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on gravitational potential and gravitational potential fields. Have a lovely day.